the, the text that we do have in terms of um, more modern printings of the, the lectures, um, they agree and are uh, the same as the one you have there with the red binding? Well, that's another difficulty. Hmm. Um, Kuiper thought um, he, when he returned to the Netherlands and he made uh, his text ready for print, he changed here and there something because, of course, he got some reactions to his lectures. Someone said, you are mistaken. It was not that person. It was that person. Or you, you, you shouldn't use the word uh, Weltanschauung, the, the, the German word for worldview. Uh, so he, 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 he changed some little things. And, and, and uh, Warfield writes in his note in this 1899 copy that um, uh, Kuiper, by reworking his text for this printed version, um, um, made the text um, worse. So it, 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 he, 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 he amended the text, but uh, that, that, that was not good for the English. And that's also a remark I think Henry Bates, Henry Bates made. Henry Bates was a minister in the Christian Reformed Churches, mm -hmm. uh, church. And um, he, he um, edited a volume of the Stone Lectures in 1931. So that's about 30, 35 years later. And the, the Stone Lectures had not been very popular. So, but now we made a new edition and he said, well, the English is a little bit poor. Mm. Um, mm. But the interesting thing is uh, Peter Haslam, who wrote a book on the Stone Lectures. Yes, Erdman's uh, published it. Creating right. a Christian Worldview, a famous book. Mm -hmm. um, he says, well, the, the, the English in, in, in of Kuiper Stone Lectures is good and is coherent. Um, so he is very positive uh, 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 about uh, the English language, the English language Kuiper wrote in. So, and, and then he talks about the 1899 edition. He, he was very positive about it. But Hen Henry Bates was critical. Hmm. Um, I'm thinking through, you know, what, what the significance of these two different uh, reconstructions are in terms of, um, you know, I think part of your thesis in arguing for the international uh, significance or um, the scope of, of Calvinism as Kuiper um, thought through it in terms of the one being more of a hasty English translation and the other one being more of a well thought through a lot of effort went into it from Calvin uh, as you're I'm sorry from uh, Kuiper um, as you're arguing so um, you know what what does your reconstruction in terms of Kuiper's um, yeah, great effort uh, and work that got put into it, say to his desire for an international influence of, of Calvinism. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, <clears throat> several things. In the first place, Kuiper had been working on other translations as well, also, also in the years before 1898. And it struck me um, how close he looked at the translations, how important it was for him to have the books from the Dutch translated into English very well. Um, and he had difficulty in finding the right translators, um, but it was very important to him that his books uh, would be published in, in really good English because indeed he wanted to introduce Calvinism to America or to introduce maybe I think in his opinion, it was reintroduce Calvinism to, to, to America. Um, so he, he, he was very keen on having a very exact and good uh, translation. That's one part of the story. Uh, so it, uh, it, it convinced me that uh, he thought it was very important to have a good introduction in the Anglophone world. Hmm. And from a historical point of view, it was important um, for me to correct the picture that Kuiper um, more or less um, made it very difficult for Warfield because he only sent it in 10 days before and then he, he ordered that translation. <laughs> Quick, you have to do this for me. And this is part of the image that people have in the Netherlands about Abram Kuiper. He was a very difficult man. He was... Um, he was very autocratic. Uh, everyone had to listen to him. And he didn't mind if, if he brought people into big difficulties, if only would happen what he would yes. uh, be done, that, mm. that, that would be done. 
So, but here you see, that's not the case. Kuiper, Kuiper, in my opinion, never asked Warfield to do this, and Kuiper himself took care for the translation. So he wasn't the difficult guy that people like to uh, people like to see him like. So he 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 did he prepared himself very well. He didn't rely on other people. He just made his own text, and he came um, completely trained and ready to to give the lectures. So uh, for, for, for me, it is important to stress that aspect because the fact that he did this strange request to Warfield is used in historiography to show that Kuiper was a difficult man. Maybe, uh, I, I don't deny he was a difficult man, <laughs> but anyway, you cannot prove it with this. <laughs> 